All right, in 9.2c, we're going to look at type 2 errors and the power of a test. All right, the power of a test against a specific alternative hypothesis is the probability that the test will reject the null at a chosen significance level alpha when the alternative is true. Now, it's very wordy, hard to understand, so I say it's the probability that we have correctly rejected the null, that we did not make a mistake when we rejected the null. So let's think about this probability, okay? It's the probability of avoiding a type one error is what we're doing. We're avoiding a type two error, I'm sorry. It's the probability that we reject the null given that the alternative is true, okay? So to find that, it's one minus the probability of a type two error, okay? It's a complement. Now, type 2 error we symbolize it with the beta b, and so power can be written as 1 minus beta. So let's look at this table, and you can see better the relationship, what's going on. So if I rearrange this equation, power plus beta is equal to 1, right? So you can see this in this table. So if I rejected the null, and the null is true, then that's a... Um, type 1 error, right? That's our alpha value. We said the probability of a type 1 error is an al is alpha. If I fail to reject the null and the null was true, then that's a correct decision. That's good. If I fit, if I rejected the null and the alternative was true, that is correct, and this is what we call power. And then lastly, if I failed to reject the null, but the null if I failed to reject the null and the alternative was true, that is a type 2 error, also known as beta. Now, what I want you to see is that power and beta together are complements, just like we saw over here. These are complements. It's easy for students to think that alpha and beta are complements. So if alpha goes up, this goes down. It's not true. Okay, They are related, but it's not in that way. We'll dive into this in a moment. A potato chip producer and its main supplier agree that each shipment of potatoes must meet certain quality standards. If the producer determines that more than 8% of the potatoes in the shipment have blemishes, the truck will be sent away to get another load of potatoes from the supplier. Otherwise, the entire truckload will be used to make potato chips. To make a decision, the su supervisor will inspect a random sample of potatoes from the shipment. The producer will then perform a significance test using these hypotheses. Suppose that the true proportion of burnt blemished potatoes is P equals 0 0.10, so 10%. Okay, this means that we would reject the null because the true proportion, 10%, is less than 8%. Now, will the inspector be more likely to find convincing evidence that the proportion is greater than 8% if he looks at a small sample of potatoes or a large sample of potatoes? And how does this affect power? All right, so we gotta think about this for a little bit. The larger the sample, the closer it is to the true parameter. That's what we're going for. A larger sample will be more beneficial because more data increases our chance of making a good decision or a better decision, okay? It'll help us know better. So what has this really affect power? Well, the larger your sample size, the greater your power because your results are gonna be more dependable if you have a bigger sample size, so you have greater power and reliability in your test. So will the inspector be more likely to find convincing evidence that the proportion is greater than 8% if he uses alpha of 10% or an alpha of 1%? And how does this affect power? Well, what you have to do is remember what alpha represents. That's an area under the curve. So if I have a 10% area, how does that compare to a 1% area? Well, a 10% area is much larger than a 1% area. So if um, that means there's, I have a better chance of rejecting the null if it's 10% than I do if it's just a 1%. So you have to think through alpha and the beta numbers. So remember, alpha is our probability of type 1, beta is probability of type 2. Now we did say before they are not complementary, but they are inversely related. Okay, these two right here, the two diagonals, they don't add up to 1. Power and beta, or the type 2 error, do add up to 1. So um, even if alpha goes up, beta goes down, and vice versa. But that doesn't mean they're complements, so be careful about saying complements. So if alpha goes up, 
beta goes down, that means our power increases because if this number gets lower, this number gets higher, right? So our power will increase. So here's the bottom line that you need to remember. If alpha goes up, power goes up, right? Greater area under the curve means I'm more likely to reject the null correctly. So if alpha is 10% instead of 1%, it's easier to reject the null. Because we'll reject the null more often, we are less likely to make a type 2 error. Therefore, there's more power involved. Part C. Suppose that a shipment of potatoes arrives and the proportion of blemished potatoes is 50% that are blemished. Okay. What will the inspector be, or will the inspector be more likely to find convincing evidence that it's greater than 8% for the first shipment, which was 10% blemished, or for a shipment that's 50% blemished? How does effect size affect power? Now, this is talking about reality versus um, the null value. So if he has a shipment that's 50% bad, is that going to be more noticeable than a shipment that's 10% bad? when our standard is only 8%. So think about it that way. Effect size is the difference between the hypothesized value, the null value, and the truth. So as effect size increases, power increases. You're gonna note, if effect size is the difference between the actual and the hypothesized. So if that difference gets bigger, you're more likely to make a correct decision, therefore increasing your power. It's easier to see the shipment as bad when the actual proportion of bad potatoes is farther from the hypothesized values. 50% is farther from 8% than 10% is, right? That's what effect size is talking about. Actual versus hypothesized. All right, is there anything else that affects power? Well, controlling other sources of variability, like using controlling or blocking, helps those results be more accurate which then in turn increases our power. So the, the way things are sampled or the way the experiment is done can increase your power. Suppose that the true proportion of blemished potatoes is 11%. If alpha is 0.05, the power of a test is 0.76. They calculated it for us. Now it's asking us to interpret this value. Okay, so the true proportion is 11%. I need that and I need this as a probability, right? So here's how I would interpret this. Let's say given that the true proportion of blemished potatoes is 11%, so I'm just right straight up from there, there is a 0.76 probability of finding convincing evidence that the true, true proportion is greater than 8%. Okay, this is my alternative hypothesis. This is the actual, okay. This is the power that was calculated for me. In most cases, it's gonna be calculated for you. Right, and then what's the probability of a type 2 error for this test? Well, remember type 2 is beta, and probability type 2 is beta, and it's 1 minus the power. So if I know the power, I can just subtract it from 1, and I get 0.24. That is the probability of a type 2 error in this problem. Notice, I didn't have to calculate the power up here on part E, but they did ask me to calculate type 2 error. So you could have that, but they're just it's just a complement. In the Benford's Law and Fraud example from the previous lesson, we tested the claim that 30.1% of the numbers in financial records begin with the digit 1. Suppose that P is equal to 0.25. That is, 25% of all the records of this company begin with the digit of 1. When alpha is 0.05, the power of the test comes out to be 0.58. So part 8, interpret this value. So here's how I'd interpret it. Given that the true proportion of expenses that start with 1 is 0 .0, there is a 0.58 probability that there will be convincing evidence that the true proportion is not equal to 0 .301. Okay. So notice here, given that the true proportion is what the actual value is, here's your power number, and here is what's in your alternative hypothesis. Okay. B, how can AGL and Associates increase the power of the test? So we talked about some ways you can increase, right? One way, you can increase the time, increase your power by increasing your sample size. The downside of that, it takes more time and it takes more money. You can increase your significance level also, but the problem with that is you may end up um, 
finding that you need to investigate, but you really don't because you've made it easier to reject the null. Another way to increase your power is to use a stratified sample. Again, it takes more time and more money and more manpower to do that. So there are all three ways you can increase your power. Now, you can't really change effect size, but that is a way you can increase power, but you don't really have control over that. So let's look at part C on effect size. It says, what values of P would the power of test be greater than 0.58, assuming everything else has stayed the same? So we know that the power is 0.58 if the true value is 0.25 compared to the null value. So we need to have a larger difference between the null value and the actual values because it's easier to detect that way. So here's what I did. I took 0.301 and I subtracted the 0.25, the actual, and I found the difference to be 0.05. So if the effect size is this on this low end, if I add 0.051, it gets me up to 0.352. So if I want my power to be greater, it needs to be further out on both ends. So finding that those ending values, basically, I know that I'm going to increase my power if, if I can get a p-value that's outside those boundaries. So any p-value that is less than 0.25 or greater than 0.352 is farther away from the null and therefore would increase our power.